was a youth pastor back in Dallas, uh, we were doing a series on what made our church, what made our beliefs distinctive from other denominations or other religions. And so one of the things to make the series more engaging to the students, uh, me and a couple guys from the youth ministry, we went out to some different churches and different places and shot video uh, to be used during the talks uh, to kind of illustrate what made our belief distinctive and why it's different from these other groups. And one week we went to a Catholic church to visit because we wanted to find out about communion. We wanted to find out because we knew that uh, Catholics ascribe to a belief that the, uh, the wafer, the, the bread, the wine actually turns into, becomes literally the body and blood of Christ. And our church and Protestant churches don't believe that. It's symbolic of Jesus' body and his blood. And so it was interesting, we went, and the first time I'd ever, I'd ever been to a Mass, and it was definitely different than any church service that I had been to before, but one thing that stood out to me, even though I strongly believe that uh, Scripture clearly teaches that the, the bread and the wine don't turn into the actual body and blood of Christ, and probably most of you don't either, and if you have questions about that, we won't get into that today, but feel free to, to email me or come and see me, we can talk about that. But uh, one thing that did strike me was the high view that they had of communion compared to the churches that I grew up in. How seriously and how integral the communion service was as part of their service. And I think that maybe a lot of Protestant churches, because of some of those differences, we let the pendulum swing so far the other direction because we want to distance ourselves and that we sometimes look at communion as kind of an afterthought, or, you know, Jesus told us to do it, so we got to do it, so we'll do it as sparingly as possible every quarter or whatever. And many times, you know, when you walk in and see communion, you look at your watch, and you're like, oh, it's going to be later getting out of here today. And we have a very, very low view of communion. And so today, we're going to skip ahead to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because of the nature of the topic of the subject we were going to deal with today that fell next, and then we'll return to that passage in chapter 10 um, next week. But today we're going to look at communion. We're going to take a look at the Lord's Supper. And what I love about Scripture, and I say this a lot, is Scripture forces us, as we teach through Scripture, it forces us to deal extensively with some things that we may not spend 40 minutes on talking about. Communion. But I can assure you, as I got in and studied this passage of Scripture, this could be a three or four week series easily because there's so much um, great information and, and really challenging stuff here. And so I'm excited to be able to share this passage with you today. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look from verse 17 through 34, but let me read verse 17 through 22, and then we'll pray, and then we'll jump into this. The Apostle Paul writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, But in the following, following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be fractions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and, you, and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you humbly admitting that apart from the, your Holy Spirit speaking through our hard hearts, through our carelessness and our casualness, about the way that oftentimes we treat you, that nothing spiritual will change in our life today. Nothing uh, honest will happen in our lives and our hearts. But God, we know that your spirit longs to make these words of Scripture alive and true. And God, I pray that you will allow them to, be, uh, to awaken our hearts spiritually. God, I pray for the kids in the room, God, that uh, today they might be able to stay engaged and stay focused. And thank you for them joining us here and help us as parents to uh, make sure we follow through and spend time with our kids individually and together, God, talking about your word and talking about what matters in life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you look through 
the book of Acts in the New Testament, the early church was pretty much an amazing sight to behold. Because what had happened was, through the gospel, radical social implications occurred. In fact, that these things that separated people, things that divided people, the gospel tore down those barriers, those warring factions that existed in the world. The gospel came alive in people's lives, and those differences could be put aside. Paul said it great in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, when he said that there's neither Jew nor Greek. That's super radical in itself. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so Paul wasn't saying there's not different roles that we have in the church. There's not cultural distinctions that we should embrace. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is that as Jesus followers, that's what I am before anything else. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, your identity is in Jesus more than it is in being an American, more than it is in being a Democrat or Republican, more than it is being an Alabama football fan, even though I know it's tough for some of y'all. It's more than anything else in life, your identity should be first and foremost Jesus Christ. And nothing illustrates that more in Scripture than the Lord's Supper, communion, Eucharist, whatever churches call it different things. It's all the same thing. When we gather around the Lord's table for a time to remember him and remember the gospel and to remember what he did. But the church at Corinth had taken something that should be so beautiful and so amazing and a picture of what Christ did for us, and they turned it into a complete and utter the disaster, as, if, as they did most things as we've studied in this book. And look what he says. Paul says in verse 17, he says, he says, I can't commend you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but it's for the worse. So he says that the gathering of the believers obviously should be a time of encouragement, love, unity, fellowship, serving one another. But he says, this gathering, it's anything but that. It's toxic. It's detrimental to your relationship with Jesus. It's, if people see this happening in your church, they're, they're going to be repelled from Jesus, not drawn to Jesus. And so the body of Christ should be demonstrating who Jesus is, and rather the church at Corinth was doing just the opposite. And Paul says it's a disaster. It's toxic. But very interesting what he says in verse 19. And we're going to spend a bit of time on verse 19 because I think this is critical. What he says, he says, There must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Do you get that? He says that these factions are actually can be a really good thing because it reveals who truly is following Jesus and who's not. Who's allowed the gospel to sink down deep into their heart and those who have not done that? And what is the gospel? The gospel is the radical grace of God. That even though we belittle God with our actions, with our thoughts, with our attitudes, with our words, even though we've brought down the glory of God through what we've done, that God came for us when we were undeserving. That God sent Jesus to pay for our sins and do what we could not do. And it's all grace and it's all mercy because we've done nothing at all to deserve this. And so these factions, these divisions, they show who really understands the gospel and those who either have a very casual relationship with the gospel or aren't believers in the first place. And so these factions revealed who was genuine, who was true. And, and practical, we know, practically, we know that's true. If you've been around church for a while because it's full of people like you and me, there's going to be opportunities for arguments, fights, church splits, those type of things. And if you've been a part of that, it becomes clear who's being selfish and who, and, and who wants to live the gospel and show integrity and leadership. I remember one time I was part of a church that was going through a very tough time and there was all kinds of division in the church. And one guy who was actually a leader in the church, a leader, I was on the phone with him, and I was talking to him about the people that offended him in, in a matter. And I said, come on, man, you've got to go to them and make this right. And I was on the phone with him. You've got to go to them and make this right. You've got to go at least talk and have a conversation. And he literally said this to me. This is no exaggeration, no joke. He, he yelled at me over the phone. He said, John, what about me? What about me? Who's coming to me? Who's coming to me, John? And at that point, I understood that at that point in his life, the gospel was not in his heart the way it should have been. Because as soon as we start making about, come to me, 
Because I'm right. We've missed the point of the gospel because the gospel says that Jesus came for us when we couldn't come for him. And we live the gospel out that we initiate, we pursue, we go after the broken, that leave the 99 to seek after the one. That's the gospel. And Paul says these factions in the church are illustrating that the gospel is not in your life. It's not taken hold. It's not taken root. And faith is something that you might talk a good talk about, but your actions clearly show the truth. And so I think the question for us is, what is our doing saying about our belief? What is our doing, our actions, saying about what we believe? Not what we say, but what our actions say about what we believe. Because we can talk a big talk about love and forgiveness and acceptance, but our actions show whether we believe that or not. You know, and I think sometimes when people just kind of drift into a Sunday morning service and pretty much their faith is just a religion, something they do, someplace they go, that faith seems very easy, all right? You know, I mean, you just ascribe to some spiritual cliches and, you know, you just know a few things to say at the right opportunity. And so the idea that faith is hard and it's difficult and it's tough may come to a surprise that a pastor would say that, that faith is hard. Because for you, you think it's not hard. You know, it's actually really, really easy. But, it, but I'm here to tell you that faith is hard. Why is faith hard? Because faith is giving yourself completely to Jesus, completely to the gospel. And it's dying to yourself and living completely for him. And obviously that's a process that we get to that point where we understand that it's dying more and more to ourselves every day and living more and more for Christ. But when we begin to truly trust the gospel, we trust Jesus, it's radical and faith's hard. And look, all of us, all of us from time to time go through periods where we feel like God's a million miles away. We feel like our prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. We feel like that, you know what, there's, there's no life. There's no, there, you know, I, I don't feel it. There's times that we all experience those times. But we, we, we understand that faith presses through. It doesn't get discouraged because God seems distant or, it's distant or God feels different. It's a time that you, your faith says, I believe what God said is true, and I'm going to act because I do believe. And so if you find yourself today in that situation where your faith is very, very small, you're really struggling, you feel like that God's not here, I don't know why I even do this, it doesn't work, I encourage you to trust God and understand that faith is about just giving it all over to God. I think as you think about faith, I think one illustration which has been used a lot over the years, but I, I was trying to think of, of a, a faith illustration for the kids that really made sense, and I just kept coming back to Charles Blondin, who was a French uh, tightrope walker back in the 1860s, that he would walk over Niagara Falls. And so I've asked Aubrey uh, to come and help me with this illustration today because it's Family Worship Sunday. I like to have a child be involved in, in this, and so come on up here with me. But if you don't remember the story of Charles Blondin, you may not remember the name, but you may remember the story, um, that he would in, uh, perform these incredible feats where he would walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And people were just amazed at what he could do. I mean, his balance and his, just fearlessness. And not only could he walk across the tightrope, he began to do things that people couldn't imagine. He began to walk on stilts across the tightrope hundreds of feet up above Niagara Falls. He walked across blindfolded. And as you see here in the picture, he pushed a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. But wait right there, I'll bring my prop to you. And as the crowd grew more and more confident in what he was doing, he would ask him, do you really think I can do this? Do you think I can push this across? Do you think I can go blindfolded? And the crowd responded. Their, their confidence was high. Yes, you, we've seen you do it. It's amazing. But the next question that he asked really separated whether they truly, truly believed or not when he said, who thinks that I can push a person across 
the tightrope. Well, instantly, most of the hands went up. Yeah, we, we know you could do that. We know you're capable of doing that. But then he said, okay, somebody volunteer. Come on, get in. Aubrey, you want to get in? Are you ready to go across the tightrope? He said, I need you to get in. Can you imagine any responsible parent allowing their child to do that? Knowing that it would be instant death if he slipped or if something went wrong. And I want, I'm going to push you up here so you're not behind. Yeah, hang on. <laughs> I want you, I'm going to leave this up here, not her. She, she'll go back in a second. But uh, um, I, I'm going to leave this up here today because this is what faith is about. It's about giving yourself more fully to Jesus. To say, you know what, faith isn't just adhering to some beliefs, saying that I believe, but it's giving my life over to Jesus. And that's what baptism pictures, and it shows as well, that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is a living sacrifice. Coming to church on Sunday morning, you know, giving up, you know, a couple hours on the lake one Sunday, that's not sacrifice. That's not discipleship. Discipleship, following Jesus, is about saying, Jesus, I want to turn more and more and more of my life over to you. Thank you, Aubrey. I appreciate it. You need help getting out? I'll hold it steady, okay? Give her a hand, will you? Great job. Shake my hand. And so how do we increase our faith? Romans says, Romans chapter 10, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? Somebody say it. The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It's taking what we know and applying it, acting upon it. And here's the thing. Many of us long for those spect spectacular moments, those two or three defining things that get us all excited and pumped up. But most of the Christian life is mundane. It's long obedience in the same direction, just doing the right thing a thousand times. It's the little stuff. Yet we want to make faith into this, you know, oh, it, it's, it's so, it, it's this big, huge moment where, you know, I'm so defined in this, in this situation. And those are few and far between. It's faithfulness. It's Miss Ann. It's my Sunday school teacher, Bob Anderson, who passed away last week, who for 40 years taught middle school boys at, at the church back in my town, and I grew up in West Virginia. It's just faithfulness. I was having lunch with a guy this week, and he said, you know, Nothing ever good came out of my life when I pulled away from church. Nothing good came out of my life, ever. It's faithfulness to the body of Christ. It's stick to itness. It's, it's being there. It's being more of a giver than a taker. It's the grind. And most people don't like the grind. They don't like the routine of just, I'm going to stay faithful in my Bible study. I'm going to stay faithful in my prayer life. I'm going to keep doing the things that I'm called to do. But most of us, we're easily fooled because we're not pursuing that arduous, difficult process of discipleship. Instead, we're waiting around for the next high to get our spiritual excitement going, and then we fall back into our just living life ourself, for ourselves. Faith is hard. Jesus said this. I, I love Matthew 13, 44. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, when a man found it, he covered it up. Then with joy, in joy, he goes and he sells all that he has, and he buys the field. Can you imagine the guy doing that? I mean, put yourself in, in his situation here. Obviously, most people would think it was a worthless field, or somebody would have purchased it by then or wouldn't allow him to purchase it. But he knew something they didn't. See, his faith, he understood that there was something valuable there. And so it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't a drudgery. It wasn't a, a chore to, to go and buy that field. It says with joy. And even when people said, dude, do you know what you're doing, man? I mean, it's really, are you going to, you're really selling all that you have to buy that, that crazy, you know, worthless field out there? And, 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 and he's like, yeah, I'm doing it. And you, you'll see why one day, why I'm doing it. That's faith. Faith is saying, look, you may not understand, and I may not fully grasp it at this moment how, what God really, really is doing and what, he's do, what he has going on in this world. But trust me, faith says it's going to happen. It's going to take place. And you're willing to sell it all 
for the gospel. You're willing to say, I truly, truly believe. It's not just something I say. It's something I truly believe. I'm getting in. Take me, Jesus. Matthew 7, 14, Jesus also said, For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Few find it. So Jesus makes demands on people. He says, your faith is going to take action steps. And what you do says more about what you believe than what you say. I love John chapter 6, where it's very sad that Jesus was talking to, and it says the word disciples, not the 12, but others who were following him. And he gave them some very hard truth. And it says many of his disciples left at that time. They, they walked away from him. And Peter, one of my favorite people in Scripture, in verse six, uh, 67 of chapter 6, Jesus looks at the 12 and he says, Do you want to go away too? And Peter says, Lord, to whom would we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Isn't that awesome? He says, where do we go? Where, where do we go? Where, where are we going to go other than you, Jesus? Nothing else makes sense. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture and as we look at our own lives and see, you know, do my actions say that I really believe the gospel, that Jesus really is the Lord of my life? I'm truly putting all my hope and faith and trust in him. Don't let it be about just what you say with your lips. What's your life saying about what you believe where else do you go for eternal life? Only Jesus. And if the Holy Spirit re resides in you, he can begin to take that faith and make it grow. And I think the, 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 the most obvious and simple thing is we just admit. Admit our weakness. Admit our faith is weak. Admit that most of the time that we got one foot in here and one foot out. Just admit to God. He's, he's not going to be surprised by that. And in that Humility, God meets you there, and I think he'll do amazing things in your life. But these conflicts in this church were revealing who really knew the gospel, who had the gospel down in them, and those who just were going through the motions. And look what verse 20 says. It says that they thought they were doing the right thing, but they weren't even taking the Lord's Supper. They may have been going through the motions, but they weren't taking the Lord's Supper. Look, verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. You may be taking the bread, and you may be taking the wine, but it's not the Lord's Supper you're eating. Because in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. They're not waiting on anybody. They're just selfishly going and getting drunk. And, and Paul just chastises them and says, how can this be? This is not the gospel. And in this early church time period, what would happen, they would get together for these meals, which would then eventually lead into communion to the Lord's Supper. And they would call these meals love feasts. And during these love feasts, um, they would um, all bring food, kind of like a potluck, and they would bring food to the, to the gathering, and they would share. But what was happening is the rich people, the wealthy people, would get there early. They would bring, obviously, the most food, as they were the most able to do that. And they would begin eating. They would get the most comfortable spots in the house, and they would just, just start going in at it and enjoying themselves. Well, the working class guy... And the slave, obviously, they had to wait till after the day was over when their boss dismissed them from work. They would roll into the church body. But at this time, these guys, either they were gone, they had taken off and eaten the majority of the most of the food, or they uh, were there and they treated them as second-class citizens. You're in there, we're over here. And so there was all this division that was happening. And some had plenty to eat and some had nothing. And so Paul says, there's these classes, there's these divisions and as we said, there should be none of that in the church. Christ levels us all. The gospel levels us. It says that nobody deserves anything. Nobody is better than anyone else. And it doesn't matter if you come from a wealthy family or if you're a slave. In Christ's eyes, you're all the same. Yet there was this greediness and the selfishness that was existing in this church. And it was an embarrassment to the kingdom. You know, and, and we have to step back and say, how do we do that? How do we treat people in the same manner? Maybe it's not as obvious, but how do we do that? When I was a kid, our churches would um, have a bus ministry. You may have been a part, when you were uh, younger, of a church that had a bus ministry. 
And the church would bust in kids from very, very tough families, rural areas. And, uh, and, and so these kids were in, uh, five or six of them were in a Sunday school class around Christmas time that I was in. And we were sitting behind some tables, and the teacher was in front of the tables. And in that day, she had brought all these great Christmas presents in for us to have. And we were behind the tables, and she said, okay, just in a minute, I'm going to say, okay, you know, you can come get a gift, and you just pick one gift out, and that'll be your Christmas gift from me. Well, I had my eye on the biggest box on the table, plain and simple. I, I mean, that's the one I wanted, because it was big, it had to be the nicest, okay? Okay. And so I had to figure out, because I was kind of in the middle here in these tables, and people were sitting on the side of me. It's like, i got to get there first. And so I devised my plan that as soon as she said go, I would slide under the table, have a straight shot to the big gift, and take it. And that's what I did. <laughs> Boom! I was there before anybody else got the one that I wanted. Good for me. How do you do that? How do we do that in our lives? That we say, that's mine. I deserve it. Pride. I'm me. Why should I not have the best? And we step on people. We treat people with disrespect. We treat people as if they're not our equals because of our attitudes and our pride and our greediness. But God says in the church, this should not be so. And so he walks to and he reminds them of the true meaning of the Lord's Supper. He begins to tell them, Here's what the Lord's Supper is all about. And so as you're taking this and coming together and getting drunk and acting all selfish and crazy, let me explain to you what Jesus, why he did this in the first place. Verse 23 through 25, he said, For I received from the Lord, Paul says, I received this from Jesus, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I'm going to give you five truths about communion. There could have been a lot more. I had to stop at five. First, in remembering, we reattach ourselves to the story of the cross. We reattach ourselves to the story of the cross. Let me give you a little test here, all right? What is the opposite of remember? Just put, think of that in your mind. What's the opposite of remember? Okay? We think, when we use the word remember, we think, where did I put my keys? Oh, yeah, I remember. They're in my black jacket pocket. Yes, I found them. We think of remember as Recall, so we think of the opposite of remember as forget. But did you know that's not the case? Give you a little word study here for a second. No, you know what the opposite of remember is? Ready for this? Dismember. All right, not a pleasant word for a Sunday morning, dismemberment, you know. You didn't know you'd be talking about that today. But the opposite of remember is dismember. And if, you, if you've been around church for a while and you remember the old King James Bible where it talked about our body parts and it called them members to present your members so members are body parts in the original English language. Members are our are, are body, our hands, our feet. And so to dismember means to take a body apart piece by piece. Obviously, if you watch a horror movie, you know that. Yeah, dismemberment. And so to remember means to take the body parts and fuse them back together again, to put them back together. So a, a doctor would attach a limb that had been chopped off he would be remembering a dismembered limb. He'd be remembering it as he's putting it back. And so when we take communion, when Jesus said to remember, it's got this idea of more than just, oh, let me think about what he did on the cross. But it's a, a connection that takes place. It's reconnecting to Jesus. It's reconnecting to our purpose. It's reattaching ourselves to Jesus. So we as the church are the hands and feet, the body of Christ. We serve him, we do his work on this earth. But it's so easy to forget our purpose and to stray away from him. And he says, I need you to remember. So he takes us and he reconnects us to himself and to his purposes in this world. And so communion has this amazing and unique way of helping us to reconnect with Jesus. 
It re- reminds us of our purpose. It reminds us of the gospel. It reminds us of our own ability to stray away from why we were in Christ in the first place. And he reconnects us to himself. He reconnects us to the event of the crucifixion, his agony, his pain, his suffering, his death. And as much as humanly possible, we're connected to those events. And we remember the gospel. We remember our salvation. We remember that we were undeserving and what he did for us on the cross. And so it's taking our divided hearts and reconnecting them to Christ. Isn't that an amazing word picture? And so as you take communion and you're called to remember, reconnect to Jesus. Reconnect to the purpose that he's called you. And there's something just in, in communion that is as different and as special. And what Jesus calls us to is more than what you experience in your quiet time or your personal time of prayer. When the body of Christ joins together around the table, there's something that happens that's unique and that Jesus really meets us here and he connects us to himself and his death on the cross. And so we remember, we reconnect, remember. And then secondly, by remembering Jesus in a tangible, visible way, we prick our spiritual sense by physical means. We prick our spiritual sense by physical means. There's just something about holding the bread And holding the cup and just thinking, this represents the body and blood of Christ. You know, I I went to three church services a week for all my life growing up. And even though we only did communion once a quarter, I just remember even as a young child, there was just something special. It, it it, It just brought it to life, the fact that I was sitting here and I was holding this juice and I was holding the bread and I remember looking at it and thinking, you know, this, this really means something to me. You know, it's really making it alive. It's really pricking my spiritual sense. I didn't know that language, but that's what it was doing. And so there's something unique about Jesus giving us this, this object lesson saying, when you're holding this, I want you to think about the blood. I want you to think about my agony, my death, my passion. I want you to consider this. And as you touch it and feel it, I want you to recall it in a special way. Engage your senses. I love what Pastor Tim Keller says. I'm going to put this quote on the screen so you can follow along. He says, In communion, we use bread as a symbol for Jesus' body and wine as a symbol for his blood. The abstract, invisible concept of Christ's substitutionary death, that just means he died in our place, for us is translated into a palatable sign, the bread and the cup, that engages the physical senses of sight, touch, taste, and smell. All this makes Jesus' sacrifice more real to us. And at that moment, most participants find personal interaction with God is profoundly enhanced and facilitated. I can attest to that. I can believe that. It's true in my life. Number three, by remembering, we proclaim Jesus and the gospel. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Paul says, we proclaim Jesus, we proclaim the gospel to ourselves, and our strength, our faith is strengthened during these times. And and, and this the action, he says, look at look at the verse. He says, the action itself proclaims Jesus. The actual drinking and eating proclaims Jesus. And I think it's interesting, I was talking to Mitch about this this morning. Communion is the only time in the life of the church where we just don't say anything, you know? It's the one time where we have a moment of silence to really think and consider. And I was telling him, I think we need more of that because we hear talking, we hear, you know, noise all the time. And it's that time where we slow down and we listen. And our faith is strengthened during those times. Those who are weak in their faith, you're still and and you remember the tangible gift that Jesus gave us on the cross of salvation. Those who feel like you're strong in yourself, God reminds you of your dependency upon him and how without him you can do nothing. For those who are busy ignoring God, you're forced to slow down, to be still, and to listen rather than just hurrying from thing to thing, place to place, doing your thing. And so we proclaim Jesus to ourselves, but also the gospel proclaims is proclaimed to unbelievers. It's the time in the church life where we boldly say, look, if you're not a believer, 
don't take this. And so if you're a believer in here, it's a time to contemplate and say, whoa, hold on a second. It's, that's, this, why am I not taking? What's going on here? What's this about? And you begin to think about your own life. And if you've truly given your life to Christ, if you've truly put your faith in Christ, if he's your Savior and your Lord. And at that moment, the Spirit forces you to contemplate and to think about your life and think about your salvation, the most important decision you'll ever make. And so, unfortunately, I think some churches shy away from the fact that they don't boldly proclaim, look, don't take it if you're not a believer. God instituted that for a reason. And he knew that there would be people who were seeking among the church. And so don't back away and say, oh, I don't want to offend anybody here. You know, I don't want people to, like, to think we're exclusive. No, it's there for a reason. It's to proclaim Jesus in his death and the fact that there's something missing in your life. And so if you're here today and you're searching, you're seeking, you don't know Jesus, this is a time to consider, why should I not take communion? I better not take communion because I'm not a follower of Jesus. I don't know Jesus. I've never put my faith and trust in him. And it's a time for the Holy Spirit to really, really work in your life. And then Paul comes back with a serious, stern warning, which is for Christians primarily. Look at verse 27 through 32. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Verse 30, this is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we are judged, but if we judge ourselves truly, then we will not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So he says, look, you better take this time seriously. You better examine yourself. You better look at yourself and see what's going on. And, And look at this. This is amazing. All right, if you've been here doing this study of this book, this church has had so many issues. There's divisions. There's following different pastors. There's all kinds of sexual sins. This church is just off the rails. But what does he save the biggest condemnation for and the the worst threat of judgment? He didn't say this stuff when he was talking about incest. He talks about it when he's talking about failing to wait for someone at the Lord's Supper, at the Lord's table. Doesn't that seem a little bit out of balance? Like it would have came with these warnings for these other serious sins. But he saved this up for the Lord's table, for the Lord's Supper. Why is that? Because it matters what happens here. This is not just a ritual and a formality we go through because we're supposed to do it and we just mindlessly go through it. Paul says this is serious business. And when Jesus had the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal with his disciples, and he, in the Passover meal, they would be recalling their captivity in Egypt and how that God delivered them. And Jesus says, look, I'm instituting something greater here. What's going to happen tonight and tomorrow I'm going to show you that something amazing, that God's bringing in a new covenant with his people. And there's no longer a necessity for you to sacrifice lambs. And there's no longer a necessity for you to trust in these atonements because I'm going to be the ultimate satisfaction for your sin. I'm the lamb without spot and blemish who will take away the sins of the world. And so he says, you have freedom from the bondage of sin that I'm the Passover lamb. And to partake unworthy is to come giving no thought to the sacrifice of Jesus, giving no thought to what this truly symbolizes, and to just mindlessly go through the motions. Serious business, Paul says. And he says, many are sick. Many have died. That's shocking. I want to encourage you because I know some people here, you're probably kind of wired toward fear. And so you hear a passage like this, like, whoa, I don't see myself ever being like wor- worthy of this. So I'm just never going to take it because I, I don't want that to happen to me. Look, he's not talking to you. He's not talking to those who understand their weakness and their battle with sin. He's talking to those who are unwilling to engage in that battle with sin. Those who can just come flippantly and mindlessly and carelessly 
say, uh, you know, it's what I do on Sunday. I hope this makes me a better person this week. You know, maybe God will give me blessing because I took communion. I was at church and I took communion. Bless me, God. Make my week really, really good and easy. That's who he's referring to. People who don't truly reflect upon what this represents and the sacrifice that was made so that we could have freedom from sin. The ultimate Passover lamb, Jesus. And number five, by remembering, we bring unity to the body of Christ. Verse 33, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, I want you to wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat in his house, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. He says, look, this is not about you just filling up your stomach. This is about love. It's about unity. It's about togetherness for purpose. That's what the Lord's Supper shows. In fact, in, in chapter 10, back one chapter, he talks about the Lord's Supper, and he gives a couple of verses, and he says, there's one loaf, verse, tw- verse 17, put, put it on the screen, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. So he says even the illustration of what they would have done would be to take a loaf and begin to break it up and pass out the pieces. He said even this is symbolic of the fact that there's one bread and so there's, there, there, you are her one body. You're one in Christ. And so it's symbolic of the unity that we should have as a church. And he says just the opposite has taken place in your church. He said there's fightings, there's visions, there's seeing who can get to the table the first and get the most food. But he said the opposite is true. You're missing it all. You're missing it all. And so for us, what does that mean? That means that we take this time to think about the body, this body of Christ, this church community. And you reflect on literally, who are you at odds with? Who do you have bitterness toward? Who are you refusing to even engage in a handshake or a hello because of something they've done to you or said to you over the years. Or maybe you just don't like them. And so you just avoid them. And you have bad thoughts about that person. This is the time to confess that to God. Because it's bigger than you and your problems. And I was offended. And he hurt my feelings. It's it's not about you. It's about the unity of the body to fulfill the purpose, what we're called to be, the hands and feet of Christ. To serve this world, to show Jesus, to take the gospel, to disciple people. That's what God has called us to do. And when you're harboring ill feelings, when you've allowed seeds of bitterness to take control of your life, when you just have negative thoughts about somebody and you allow those to go unchecked, you're not remembering. You're not remembering. You're dismembering. You're dividing the body. So, taking action. Your doing shows what you believe. Your actions show your heart. You can say one thing. You can even go through the motions. But you're not doing the Lord's Supper. You're not doing communion because there's no communion there. So Paul's challenge to the church at Corinth and to us is commit to reconciling. Commit to a life of faith that says imperfectly, I'm going to try through the power of the Holy Spirit and through his strength to give myself completely to Jesus. And that's what I want to reconnect to today. I want to remember. I don't want to dismember. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that challenges us. God, I admit that when I thought about an entire message on communion, that I questioned your word. I questioned whether this was right. And God, I thank you that there is your word is wisdom. It's truth. It's so far beyond me, the messenger. God, it, you take it and you make it real and true in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray for those who have have, have disconnected. They're they're disconnected from their purpose. They're disconnected from you. They haven't looked at your word in a week. They're just wandering through life, 
aimlessly. God, may our recalling, our remembering this morning be a time for them to confess their inability in themselves to live out the truths of the gospel, to recommit, to reconnect to you, their Savior, and to take action and to reconcile with those who they have division with. God, I pray that you will be glorified in our lives, in our homes. And God, we just give ourselves to you as a living sacrifice.